What is up? What is up, Van Design Conference? Let's go. We are kicking this thing off finally. Uh, so excited to, to be here with you. Um, and I guess I will just take a moment to jump right in. I didn't hear any of that introduction, but I, I can, I guess it was say, they were saying a lot of nice things about me. So with that, <clears throat> purpose, purpose, purpose. Today, I want to talk uh, about um, and challenge the multi-million dollar idea called purpose. From the books, to the groups, to the TV shows, I've taken it in a part uh, of a few of them, all selling purpose. And for most of my career, I've worked as a creative director at ad agencies all over the world, helping huge brands and public personas understand and sell, of course, their purpose. But why is it that we've read all the books and done all the groups and still find ourselves walking in circles? And if you're lucky enough to spend all your time pursuing that big purpose of yours, sometimes you are rewarded with the gift of being isolated, disconnected, and discontent. <clears throat> My personal journey is begging the question, is there something else? This talk is for all those who have joined here at the Ben Conference today, still figuring it out. What are you doing with your life? And for those who you're looking up at a very different world, whether due to COVID or changes of career due to uh, job losses, and you're realizing that your purpose might not be big enough to meet this day, I'm here to say, find your art because your purpose is overrated. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get it into it all, but let me introduce myself. My name is Shabazz Larkin. I think they said some things about me. I didn't hear them, but I'm sure they were nice. <clears throat> I'm an artist an author living in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I'm the author of a book called The Thing About Bees, which is a love letter to my sons about bees, fear, and love. I paint pictures of Black life and Black heroes, Black spirituality, Black mindfulness, and Black joy. Because I knew this reality existed, though I couldn't find these images anywhere. This is the story of how I found my art. When I was in college, I stumbled into the Richmond Museum of Fine Art in Richmond, Virginia. I would go to see a painting by Kahindi Wiley entitled Willem Van you know what, honestly, I still don't know how to pronounce this. <laughs> Willem Van Havensjensen. <laughs> I shouldn't have tried. I knew I shouldn't have. I promised my wife I wouldn't. It's a picture of an African-American man that looked like one of the guys I went to high school with. But he was posing in the style of a Renaissance painting. This portrait, portrait was significant to me for a few reasons. First... I didn't think that there were any black painters or portraits of black people hanging in museums. Second, the figure in Kahindi Wiley's painting dressed like me. Most people called us hoodlum for how we wore our pants and braided our hair. But this painting made that style look like royalty. I questioned my own identity. Somehow fashion was this existential crisis a metaphor for the racist social constructs that we were forced to live under. This very deep conversation with myself and this painting went on for hours. I cried right there in that spot for hours. 
Not one word came, not one word came out of my mouth. I remember going back to my friends and not being able to explain it. I just felt it. What's happening when art does this? Perhaps I saw myself in that guy. And this painting was a kind of mirror, a validation that I didn't know that I had needed. Something, something was happening inside of me. No, my experience with this painting sounds more like someone describing an encounter with God. My breath changed, my heart rate rose, and water began dripping from my eye sockets. I was given the right to be gloriously young and black. I had been drawing my whole life, but I became an artist right there in that museum. I discovered many other black artists like them. Uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Toyin Oji Odutola, and Kara Walker, and obviously many, many more. They inspired me to find a way to express the uniqueness of my own vulnerable black culture, the way that these artists did. I began drawing pictures of bizarrely shaped afros. I put these afros on all kinds of people. There was Frederick Douglass. <laughs> there was Sidney Frotier. <laughs> the Fro Mamas, the Fro Bamas. And it was beauty fro. I was having a lot of fun. But it was my image of a robust woman with an abundant fro that would show me the true power of this work. Friends of mine began coming to me, telling me tearful stories of how they'd never seen themselves, a full-figured woman portrayed so empowered. And somehow these images made them feel empowered as well. And in a way that they just couldn't describe, but certainly could feel. This was teaching me that there is a great power in seeing yourself. It's a kind of magical moment confirming that your existence matters. It's not just a picture. Perhaps it's the God in the picture. But as the old Uncle Ben saying goes, no, not the ricey Uncle Ben, but the Spider-Man Uncle Ben, with great power comes great responsibility. And as storytellers, there's a great responsibility in choosing carefully the images that we capture, the stories that we tell, the motifs that we borrow in our design. We say we're just in the business of entertaining eyes or selling rice, but the images that we choose has the ability to expand the viewer's reality or oppress their potential. On that note, how do black boys have so much stock in rap culture and sports culture even rice culture, <laughs> but so little in Disney culture. Do black boys not dream to be kings too? And for that matter, mindfulness culture. I actually have a pretty severe version of ADHD. My life at times feels uh, outlined by this, the shame that comes from not knowing how to say no to things that excite me, random uh, outbursts and, and, ta and ta taking people down bunny trails uh, with no endings. And I'm just hoping that this talk is not one of those bunny trails. <laughs> uh, but my ADHD is also a gift for all those other people who struggle with this uh, condition. Um, because w when I'm not making my art, my spirituality, my meditation and mindfulness practices have been the tools I've found to overcome the dark side of this gift. 
despite years of shame from the from my own people uh that this is this was a practice for crazy and weak-minded people that's why i'm so glad um to be and excited to be curating content for a new mindfulness and meditation experience made to address the full spectrum of cultures and lifestyles that current wellness communities overlook starting with women of color it's an app called true voice and by the way it hasn't even launched yet um uh and but it's a special because uh, it might be one of the first wellness tools being built from the ground up with these kinds of cultural realities in mind. Everything we're doing is through the lens from, uh, from the courses we offer to the artwork and the design. Our hope is to capture more expansive image of who gets to take part in the modern wellness and mindfulness community. And on that note, um, I, I thought that this might be a good time to sort of pause and, and, and take a moment to share a few projects that I've been working on um, that come from the same place and intention. I want to share this re-edition of Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, which marks the 50th anniversary of this timeless book. It's a kind of autobiographical picture of Maya Angelou's coming to age story. <clears throat> this book was important to me because it's um, Maya Angelou, <laughs> but also it's an opportunity to portray the image of the empowered, spiritual and strong black woman that I see from the woman entrepreneurs, mothers and dynamic working professionals, uh, uh, black women that I know in my own life. Uh, which often runs counter to the monolithic sort of black female characters that are so pervasive, pervasive in television, media, design, advertising, and a lot of the things that were the people who are here at this conference are probably a part of. In some ways, the glory and trauma of black women have been a kind of hid hidden novelty to the world um, that I thought it was important to put a spotlight on um, a different uh, angle in which Maya Angelou's work is obviously very notorious for. This book was just released in collaboration with the Folio Society and I'm proud to uh, proud of how it came out. So I just had to take a minute to talk about that and I'll talk about one more project. Um, I also, uh, Sedu Kita is a strong inspiration of mine. He's a Mali born photographer that took thousands of these beautiful portraits of ordinary citizens in the context of modernizing West Africa. And he dressed them up in European clothes, uh, mostly because, you know, these, they couldn't afford the sort of the fashionable clothes of the day and tried to capture a kind of normalcy of the post, uh, you know, colonized world. I was taken by this image of a man holding a flower. The fragile nature seems so contrast to all the expectations of what a black man's posture is supposed to be. So uh, I was mesmerized by the freedom of this man so much so that I painted it. It looked like something unarticulated inside had finally come out. And getting it out let me hold space for that unarticulated thing. <clears throat> Funny enough, um, admirers of this painting sort of felt the same thing that I did. And, and it felt good to paint. So I painted it again. <laughs> and again, and again, and again. And again, and again, and they grew with color and they got darker. And I drew this image over a hundred times and they became this dynamic picture of the many facets of the black man. But it occurred to me that one in three men find themselves in this tragic, demonic, under talked about system that we know as the criminal justice system. Why us? It reminded me of when I was in high school and I took a plea deal for something uh, that I didn't commit so that I didn't see the judge. 
everyone was afraid that my penalty could end, uh, could, uh, the penalty to my, what I was being convicted of could lead me into juvenile detention because that's what they do to us. And statistics show that once you're in the system, it's hard to ever get out. And I had no idea. I just signed this thing because all the people, all the people that I loved, the parents and teachers and friends all told me that that's what I should do. Luckily, the punishment for that was just some uh, scared straight programs, uh, even though I had never done anything. But I signed the agreement anyways. Somehow along the line, I began drawing one in every three of the images of the black man in an orange jumpsuit. And through this process, which felt more like that of the monks painting mandalas, if you have ever seen them, they sort of get together and they paint these mandalas out of sand. Um, And it's more of sort of a meditative practice than it is actually a practice of, um, of painting. But I was just so happy in the process of creating and sort of unpacking these things that I felt from my own stories and my own image and my own people. This, this image began to articulate something else inside of me that I didn't know was there. And this ideal of the fragile black man took on a new meaning. Perhaps that beauty that came from this fragility and the strength that come from the process of looking into this pain. By the way, this project is going to be on display at Scale House, and I'm sure that I'd love for Renee to talk to, to talk to more about this. Right in Bend, Oregon, right? So this is happening right in Bend. So later this year, um, and if you're in town, I'd love for you to come stop by to see it. Because the images that we create are magic. You can capture a reality that isn't, but needs to be. And it can inspire our best selves, reveal our worst selves, and change the world in the process. But something more than magic is happening when our reality is reflected to us in our art. Later, I came to learn about the science Researchers have associated an energy unit with feelings measured by the glucose used to process our emotions. Now, I know I'm getting scientific, but stay with me. If we think of our brains like computer chips, emotions are messages that are sent around our whole bodies and back to our brains, creating psychological attributes like breathing and blood flow sweating, arousal, fidgeting, based on what our emotions are trying to tell us. Now, this is the part that blew my mind. They found that people who process feelings by themselves used 80% more energy than those who process feelings with someone else, leaving them more emotionally depleted and therefore unhappy. Sooner, and more often than those processing with another. I hope that you got that, that they use 80% more energy processing their feelings alone. What does it mean? In essence, we're made to do this thing called life together. What's happening is we become a kind of mirror for each other's reality. If someone or something can match our reality, then our brains tell us what we all want to know. Now get this. We exist. We are real. We're not broken. We're safe. And now we can go forward. Art can help people process our emotions as well. Art is more than pictures or sculptures or sounds or pictures on sculptures with sounds. Art is an expression of how we feel. Our experiences, our loss, our pain, our joy, our rebellion, our story, our identity. Most of us, most of all, our art is a reminder that we exist. It says you are not alone. And if you can't draw or paint or make sculptures and songs, you can make empathy. 
Because art at its best is empathy. Art is taking what's been bottled in you and splatting it all over the earth, however it wants to come out. Art is looking at your mess, your bad habits, your dark corners, and shining light there. Art is looking at your boring stories, knowing that they're boring, and finding a way to tell them anyhow. Art says your stories matter. Art turns your style into identity. And if you feel dark, don't be afraid to share your darkness. Figure, figure out how to make that darkness into a sculpture, to be a mirror to other people who feel dark as well. So someday they can feel differently. And if you feel lost, chances are there are so many others that feel lost too. You might not know how to put it into words or put it into a picture or a song, then put it into a hug, a letter, a gift, an organization for all you entrepreneurs out there. Just go find your art whatever, uh, in whatever form it brings. Whatever form brings you joy, whatever form brings the world joy. We spend our lives debating purpose and floundering what it might be when our art is sitting right under our noses. Our purpose asks a very dubious question. Who are we? An existential question that actually might not be ours to answer. Our art asks, what will you do right now with what's in front of you? And it asks again tomorrow. <laughs> because when making art, failure is dope. There is no right purpose or wrong way. Um, uh, you, if you have a feeling or an experience or something inside that has to come out and you just let it out and then you go do it again in some other way. So if art, if that art is crap, that's okay. You learn why and then you go do it some more. Art keeps us more connected to the process of being human. Instead of aspiring uh, and instead of the aspiration of success, sorry, I fumbled over my words. Let me say that again. Art keeps us more connected to the process of being human instead of the aspiration of success. Process is beautiful. But where do we start? We'll start with your shame. Because shame is a feeling that something is Shame is the feeling that something is too small or unworthy of talking about. Shame doesn't want to be articulated because it's the opposite of art. It wants to hide in the closets, under your bed, in your darkest corners. There is so much good art hiding behind a door of shame. A door of this doesn't exist or no one cares. Just waiting for you to shine your light on it. And your vulnerability is that light. And if you can be vulnerable about how you feel or how you look or think, you can help others do the same. What you may notice is that I have little to no eyebrows, <laughs> little to no hair. Suddenly at 34, over the course of a few months, all my hair had fallen out. A product of what I would learn to be alopecia. There was a period in time I couldn't look in the mirror because I hated what I saw, because I didn't recognize myself. But I love this image of me. If you can't, I don't know if they're showing the image, but uh, this image of myself uh, turning my face into art. It was my way of claiming who I am because vulnerability transforms our reality into beauty which for me transformed into a radical acceptance of self. Vulnerability is the willingness to say, I am beautiful too, just as I am. If you get alone and you get an opportunity, I want you to try to say that too. I am beautiful too, just as I am. Like a Hindi Wiley's painting that inspired me to do the same. 
Vulnerability says you exist. You are not broken. You are not alone. You are glorious. And finally, remember, for all of you aspiring artists out there, all you aspiring designers out there, and if you're here, you got a knack to make something. Remember this, Picasso is dope, but not doper than you. My name is Shabazz Larkin, and that's all I got to say about art, although I think there might be questions. So thank you very much. And that is my presentation.